Back in mid-2003, ATI released what would be one of their last DirectX 8 graphics cards, the Radeon 9200. Being an entry-level offering that was a highly cut-down version of their previous Radeon 8500, it wasn't a particularly impressive piece of kit, especially when much faster DirectX 9 hardware was already available. But what piqued my interest about this card wasn't its performance, but its similarities compared to one of the very first mid-range DirectX 8 cards, NVIDIA's GeForce 3 Ti 200 debuting way back in 2001. It got me thinking, how would an old mid-range DirectX 8 card compare against a newer entry-level one? It may not be a comparison featuring the fastest cards of a time or even a historically accurate one, but these cards have a much more interesting duel than you would think. So let's look at the battle between late and early entrants into the DX8 era and see how they stack up in this graphics card one on one. First things first, let's get into what these cards actually are, starting with the older of the two, the TI200. Now back in 2001 it released at a very convincing price of $199 USD and won over a lot of gamers thanks to its respectable price performance and being the first mainstream card to usher in DirectX 8 and its game changing programmable shaders. In the following years the card would still see some adoption from budget gamers and overall it would hold up pretty well for Nvidia's first stab at a mid-range DX8 card. As for the 9200, it was actually amongst the last of the DirectX 8 cards. While there is the very similar 9250, which released almost a year later, the DX9 capable X300 was already out by then, so I'd say it was no longer relevant in the conversation of budget cards. Where the TI200 filled the mid-range segment back in 2001, the 9200 filled the entry-level segment two years later in 2003, so as to be expected it came with a much lower launch price of around 99 to 129 USD. Back in the day reception was fairly positive considering it was a lower end offering, but there were debatably stronger options in the aftermarket by this point, particularly the GeForce 4 Ti 4200 which would have been much faster and only a little bit more expensive too. Now even though it came out 2 years later than the Ti 200, don't be fooled, it's not like the 9200 carries any major architectural advancements over the GeForce 3. It's a DX8 GPU all the same and is really just a slightly enhanced re-release of the Radeon 9000, which in itself was based off of a stripped down version of the R200 core found in ATI's top card of 2001, the aforementioned Radeon 8500. On the whole, despite the release date differential, the Radeon 9200's GPU is actually pretty contemporary with the TI200's when you think about it. With that said, how do the cards stack up specs wise? Well the 9200 loses one texture unit in each pipe compared to the TI200, but the Radeon is also clocked 43% higher on the core at 250MHz. This actually gives the 9200 the edge in raw pixel and vertex output, although it falls behind noticeably on terms of texture fill rate. Memory ends up being a similar sort of deal on each card, with both having 200MHz DDR running on a 128-bit bus giving them the exact same 6.4GB per second of memory bandwidth. The 9200 comes with double the memory though at 128MB, but to keep the testing fair we're aiming to stay within the TI 264MB limit. Just keep in mind that in general the 9200 will respond a lot better to higher quality textures and resolutions. The TI 200 does exist in 128MB versions, but they're pretty uncommon compared to the standard card. So the most relevant for this comparison is automatically the 64MB version. That's also my excuse for not searching for and inevitably shelling out for an overpriced 128MB card. As a side note on the 9200, it did come in a variant with a 64-bit memory bus dubbed the 9200SE, which was a bit cheaper and much worse, but for this video we're focusing on the 128-bit version. Alright, with all the background info out of the way, let's talk about what we're going to be testing in today's video. We're going to throw a 6 game suite at these two cards, with release dates falling between 2002 to 2005, so they are a bit past these cards time, but I've adjusted their settings so they aren't too hard on them. For the test system we're using the new AGP testbed, which has got a San Diego Athlon 64 3700+, with 2GB of DDR memory at 400MHz. It's not much to write home about, but it gets the job done and will allow these cards to perform at their best. If you're interested in the rest of the system specs, they'll be on screen for you to see. For the drivers, I picked the newest ones available for both cards, and this is very important for reasons I'll discuss after the testing. Also, I opted to capture all of the game footage from the Radeon 9200, as of the two it's the only one with the digital output. With all of that being said, let's now dig into some testing. And starting us off is Sirius Sam SE. I tested the game at 1024x768 with the normal preset in DirectX mode and used a 95 second run of the Grand Cathedral demo to measure performance. Here the TI200 comes out on top with 88 frames per second, leading the 9200 slightly by 5%. 
Frame times were okay on both cards, but they did experience a number of 40 to 60 millisecond stutters during the run, with the TI-200 having it a little worse, which is reflected in its 0.1% lows. Overall, it's a good showing for both of these cards and already has us off at a close matchup. Now it's on to Half-Life 2, and I tested a 1024x768 with the normal settings throughout, as well as simple reflections. Now the GeForce 3 is missing some effects like water reflections in this game, and this is due to it lacking the proper pixel shader support, which is present on the 9200. Because of this, just keep in mind that it's not exactly a fair fight in this game, but I was still curious to see what the cards could do. For this, I've used a manual 75 second run of the water hazard chapter of the game, and in the end the two cards are tied, both averaging 37 frames per second. Frame times were okay-ish on both cards, with them experiencing some stutter during the whole run, but weirdly enough, the TI-200 experiences this pretty bad stop of around 350 milliseconds near the end of the benchmark, and this is repeatable every single time. Aside from that, both these cards provide a very similar experience in this game, and to be honest, I think they did pretty well considering their age compared to the game. Doom 3 is the next game up, and I went for some humble settings at 480p with the low preset, as anything better is pretty much completely unplayable on these cards. Also, I used a run of the Demo 1 time demo to get my numbers. Here the TI-200 pulls off a very clear victory at 26 frames per second, or leading the 9200 by 30%. Predictably, frame times don't look so hot for the 9200, but they're acceptable for the TI-200. Also, you'll notice there's a difference in the frame time lengths, and similar to the Crisis benchmark, this is because the demo renders around 2100 frames in total, and since the game engine is tied to the frame rate during the demo, some setups can finish at different times. Next up in the list is Call of Duty 2, and I tested the game at 1024x768 with the medium settings throughout along with low textures. For the bench, I also used its demo feature with 105 seconds of gameplay from the first level. This time around the tables have turned, with the 9200 taking home a good win at 39 frames per second, or 26% faster than the TI-200 which managed 31. Frame times were also markedly better on the 9200, with this resulting graph looking a lot less rocky than the TI-200s. Overall, the 9200 provides a decidedly better experience in this game, but that's not to say that the TI-200 did bad, as the game was more than playable on it as well. Need for Speed Most Wanted is up next, and we tested at 1024x768 with the low settings and used 2 minutes of the first race against Razer for the bench. Here the TI-200 ekes out a tiny victory of only 1 FPS over the 9200, or only 4%, so pretty much within a margin of error. Frame times were pretty awful on both cards as they see relentless stutter throughout the entire run, but the 9200 had it even worse off, with its stutters being noticeably harsher than the competition. While the averages were more than fine for these cards, the stutter kind of soils the experience and in the end it's only barely playable on these cards. And finally we have Freedom Fighters. Here I stepped up the resolution to 1280x1024 and used normal settings with low textures. For the capture I used 60 seconds of gameplay from the first level as it's demanding and repeatable. The Radeon is the victor this time with it averaging 40 frames per second and is 18% faster than its rival at this mark. Both cards had their fair share of stutter in the middle of the run, but it seemed to be way worse on the TI-200 for some reason. Overall, it's another good showing for the 9200. All in all, I was pretty happy to see the cards trading blows in this test suite. Last up, I wanted to show a chart averaging all of the games tested, and as we can see, both cards are actually dead even on terms of average frame rate, which I was incredibly surprised to see. The two contenders definitely had their ups and downs in this suite, but I was expecting one or the other to clearly come out on top. At least with these drivers though, they're virtually equivalent to each other in performance. So, in the end, which card is the stronger option overall? Well, to start, if you look at reviews and recommendations of the time, most people say that the TI-200 was better, but clearly that's not what I observed in these tests. So what's going on? Well, as it turns out, the 9200 has an ace up its sleeve shared with many other R200 cards, and that's the drivers. While Nvidia's GeForce 3 cards performed very well with their initial drivers, they didn't see a great deal of improvement in the following years, whereas the R200 cards didn't have the best start, but kept getting better and better. This effect can also be seen with the duel between the Radeon 8500 and the GeForce 3 TI 500, with the latter winning a majority of performance tests back in 2001 by a fairly significant margin. 
Test the later drivers though, and the cards are much better matched, with the 8500 able to lead the TI500 in some cases as well. That battle over time clearly shows that the R200 cards just needed a little more time in the oven to reach full potential, and the same holds true for the Radeon 9200, as I bet if I tested the initial drivers it would have turned out in the TI200's favor. Overall, it's a very even playing field between these two cards, and with later drivers they are pretty much equivalent to each other. Hats off to ATI for closing that gap over the years with just drivers, even though I'm sure most R200 card owners would have moved on to greener pastures by the time their cards reached that peak. So it's a wash performance wise, but what if you're looking at either one of these cards for a retro system today? Well this is where I think it gets a lot more interesting. You see, 128MB 9200s can still be found pretty easily on the used market for a decent price, but a TI200 is going to run you nearly double the price online, and that's for the 64MB cards. 128MB versions tend to go for even more. Considering they perform the same, but the 9200 is around half the price and easier to find 128MB versions, these days I think it's better than a TI200, at least if you're trying to build a retro PC without breaking the bank. Just don't get any of the gimped versions with a 64-bit memory bus, as their performance is extremely terrible and actually worse than a 64-bit FX5200, truly an awful accomplishment when you think about it. I will say, it's not like you can't find a TI-200 for a good price, I mean I got mine for pretty cheap, but that's the exception, not the rule, and chances are it's going to be a 64 megabyte card. On another note, testing these cards out for the video was a real pleasure, and it made for some pretty interesting results that I didn't see coming. If I were to test them again, it would probably be in an early 2000s GPU comparison video, where I'd line them up against some other tough competition from the era. I have to say I was most surprised by just how good the 9200 is as a retro card these days. I didn't experience any issues with its final drivers, it performs pretty well in DX8 games, and it's so easy to obtain. Anyhow, as for what's next, I'm definitely pretty stoked to be working on a video I have coming up, which is going to be revisiting a certain retro PC that was featured on the channel a couple months back. With that, thanks for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you all in the next one.